Hello, and welcome to the Army Sustainment Command Packaging, Storage, and Containerization Center's video series on the care of supplies and storage, or COSIS. Module 5, Unit Pack Marking Requirements. This module will address the following topics. Missing or incorrect markings, unit pack identification, method 50 or electrostatic discharge sensitive markings, and we will conclude with a walkthrough on how to find this information. Ensuring that the unit pack is correctly marked is everyone's responsibility, from vendors to distribution depots to installation and tactical supply support activities everyone must do their part to ensure that items can be correctly identified and from a COSIS perspective, handled and preserved properly. Mill Standard 129, Military Marking for Shipment and Storage, is the Army standard that spells out the marking requirements. This video will explain what identification information and special markings must be placed on all unit packs to ensure that the necessary item data and preservation requirements are known. There are several ways in which missing or incorrect markings can have a negative effect on Army material. Some examples of this include improperly marked items shipped to DLA distribution depots are at a high risk for being placed in suspended stock. When items that require special handling precautions, such as Method 50 or electrostatic discharge sensitive items, are improperly marked, their unit packs may end up being opened to verify contents, putting these items at risk for damage or deterioration. Lastly, effective visual COSIS inspections rely on accurate preservation data printed on the unit pack label. When this information is omitted, COSIS inspections become inefficient as inspectors cannot quickly and definitively verify if an item is preserved correctly. Correctly labeled unit packs begin with vendor compliance to Department of Defense contracts. As seen here in Section B of a DLA solicitation for a circuit card, the solicitation that the vendors bid on will either explicitly contain the packaging and marking requirements or reference the mill standards where these requirements can be found. If the vendor is awarded the contract, they are then obligated to satisfy all requirements of the contract, which includes not only the item, but the correct packaging and labeling of the item as well. However, it is not uncommon to find that this is not always the case, and as a result, items end up entering the stock system with inadequate packaging and non-compliant labels. When this occurs, it falls to those downstream to identify, correct, and report these issues. Unfortunately, the only time it may be possible to capture all of the required identification data is at the manufacturer. As you will see in the walkthrough, it may or may not be possible for personnel at a depot or supply support activity to determine all of the required information. When this is the case, it is the responsibility of the packaging specialist to generate a label that includes as much of the required information as possible for the item they are remediating. Here is an example of a typical unit pack label. Three things that are common to all identification markings, regardless of the method of application, is that all letters are capitalized, the data is consistently arranged in the same order, and if the method of preservation requires a barrier bag, the markings are applied to both the barrier bag and the unit container. We will begin by listing all of the required identification information. Then we will go back and discuss each line in more detail. The first line should always be the national or NATO stock number. The second line is the commercial and government entity code or cage code for short. Line three is the part number. Line 4 is the item nomenclature. Line 5 is the quantity. Line 6 is the contract number or purchase order number. Line 7 is the method of preservation and the date it was preserved. The next two lines are for shelf life data if applicable. If the item has a serial number, it goes here. And lastly, machine readable linear or 2D barcodes. We will now discuss each piece of identification information in more detail. 
the first line contains the national or NATO stock number. This 13-digit number is made up of the 4-digit Federal Supply Classification Code, or FSC code, and the 9-digit National Item Identification Number, or NIN. Since the NSN is the primary means of identifying an item, it must always be included on the label and is the first piece of information listed. Next, we have the item's cage code. This is written as the abbreviation CAGE followed by the number. In most instances, this five-digit code will represent the manufacturer of the item. As we will see in the upcoming walkthrough, finding the correct CAGE code may or may not be possible. Line 3 is the manufacturer's part number. This is always printed as P, N, followed by the part number. The item nomenclature is a high-level, generalized description of the item. The quantity is always listed as the number followed by the unit of issue. This line can be either the contract number, purchase order number, or lot number. For type 2 shelf life items, that is, shelf life items that are extendable, this number must be printed somewhere on the unit pack. The method of preservation line provides the specific MOP number and the date the item was preserved. It should always be printed as M, followed by the MOP number, and then the month and year the item was preserved. During COSIS inspections, inspectors should always be checking the MOP number printed on the label against what they are actually seeing. Also, Realizing this information is printed on the label will help increase the efficiency and effectiveness of your inspections. When your stock is properly marked, identifying high-risk items as a priority, such as those with mops in the 50s and 40s, or GX, is as easy as looking at the label. The next two lines are for shelf life data. The first line will either be the manufactured, cured, assembled, or pack date, followed by the month and year it was made. The second line provides the expiration date for a Type 1 item or a test and spec date for a Type 2 item, followed by either the month and year or a quarter and year in which the item comes due. As previously mentioned, it is important to note that Type 2 shelf life items should always have a contract, lot, or batch number printed somewhere on the unit container, as this information is essential to determining if the item shelf life can be extended. If the item has a serial number, it goes here. This line will always begin as you see it with S, E, R, space, N, O, followed by the serial number. If the item does not have a serial number, this line is left blank. Unit pack barcodes can be either linear or 2D. MIL standard 129 refers to a linear barcode as code 39 and a 2D barcode as PDF-417. If your organization has the capability to print barcodes, it will include the NSN, and if applicable, the serial number and unique item identifier. Now that we have covered all of the required item identification data, we will discuss Method 50 and Electrostatic Discharge Sensitive, or ESDS, markings. Method 50 and ESDS markings are found in the Special Markings section of MIL Standard 129. They are essentially warning labels. Having a thorough understanding of these markings is critical to effective COSIS because the items that require them are at the highest risk for damage or deterioration should they be mishandled. Also, similar to the item identification information, these markings are applied to both the barrier bag and the unit container. In the walkthrough portion of this video, we will examine how to determine if these markings are required. You may recall from Module 2 that we covered methods of preservation as part of the Determining Preservation Requirements process. There are five methods of preservation, or MOPs, that fall into the Method 50 category. They are MOPs 51, 52, 53, 54, and 55. The common link between all of these methods is that they provide water vapor-proof protection and require that desiccant be placed inside the sealed barrier as an added measure to defend against moisture buildup. This is the best environmental protection that Army packaging can provide and is only used for items that are at the highest risk of corrosion. 
because these items are high risk and usually very expensive, it is absolutely critical that their packaging is not inadvertently opened. To prevent this from happening, these items must be clearly labeled with Method 50 markings on both the barrier bag and the unit container. Electrostatic discharge sensitive items are at a high risk for damage if improperly handled. Because damage caused by electrostatic discharge cannot be visually detected, if an ESDS item is improperly handled, it must be moved to batch code F and sent for a technical inspection before it can be placed back into stock and issued. Because of this, ESDS packaging must be clearly labeled to prevent direct human contact with the bare item. There are two MOPs you need to be aware of with respect to ESDS markings. MOP GX is a dedicated MOP specifically for ESDS items, and of the two, it is the MOP you will see most frequently. Anytime you see a MOP of GX, you will need to apply ESDS warning labels. There are also rare occasions when a MOP 41 item may also be ESDS. You will learn how to recognize if an item is ESDS regardless of the MOP in the upcoming walkthrough. The important thing to remember is that any time an item is identified as being electrostatic discharge sensitive, you must apply ESDS warning labels to both the barrier bag and the unit container. Now that you know what information goes on the unit pack label, the only remaining question is how do you find it? We will now do a brief walkthrough to demonstrate how you can find as much of this information as possible. Note, because it may be necessary to physically inspect the item for information, this process should be done prior to the actual packaging remediation. In this scenario, let's assume that while performing a COSIS inspection, we find an item in need of remediation with the following conditions. The item is bare and tagged with the NIN. It is not a shelf life item. There is no information printed on the item. It is the only one of its kind in stock. To begin gathering the label information, open FedLog, verify the Army tab is selected, and enter the NIN. Clicking search will take you to the Army Master Data File, or AMDF tab. From this screen, we get the following information. The NSN is a combination of the FSC code and NIN. So for this field, we have 3120-01243-6580. The item name will provide us with the required nomenclature. Since in this scenario we are working with a bare item, it is also a good idea to compare the item to its stated description to ensure the NIN on the tag was really for this item. The last piece of information we will pull off this tab is the unit pack quantity which in this case is one each. Next, we can click on the packaging tab to view the mop. Here, we can see that the mop is 33. If we are remediating the item in December of 2019, the mop line would be M33-12-19. Note, if the item has a special packaging instruction, the MOP field may not provide any useful information. If that is the case, you will need to refer to the SPY in order to obtain the MOP number. If you are unfamiliar with SPYs, you can learn about them in Module 2, Determining Preservation Requirements. Once we have the MOP code, we will go to the Reference tab. It is here that we will potentially be able to obtain the part number and cage code. If, upon visual inspection of the item, you observe the cage code and part number printed on the item, then simply copy that information over to the identification label. If, however, this information is not available, then it is here on the FedLog Reference tab that we can attempt to get what we need. Notice that for this NIN, there is a single cage code and part number. And just below this information, you can see the name and address of the manufacturer that is represented by that cage code. This particular example is straightforward. If there is only one cage code and part number, then that is what you will put on the identification label. The big question is what do you do when there are multiple part numbers and cage codes for a single NIN? As you can see in this example, there are two different part numbers and three different cage codes. 
In instances like this, the first step is to see if there is anything printed on the item that will help you to determine the other pieces of information. If there is a cage code or a part number or the company's name printed on the item, you can use that information to figure out the unknowns. For example, if the item only had the word Bosch printed or stamped on it, you can then determine that the cage code is 77521 and the corresponding part number is 707558. Keep in mind that the item you are remediating was made by a specific company whose design may be similar to but not exactly the same as other companies. Therefore, randomly selecting a part number and cage code from those listed is not acceptable. If you cannot make any clear determination as to the correct cage code or part number, these fields should remain blank. At this point, FedLog has taken us as far as it can. We will now address the remaining items on our identification label, those being the contract number, shelf life data, serial number, and barcode. Unfortunately, there is no practical way for you to determine the contract number or serial number unless they are either printed on the item or the item's original packaging. Since our item is bare, with no markings, we will be unable to identify the contract number or serial number for this item, and will therefore omit them from the label. Shelf life is a complete topic in and of itself, and we hope to create a video that will thoroughly cover it in the future. For the purposes of this video, we will just say that if shelf life rules permit the item to be remediated, you must be able to print the item's shelf life dates on the label. It is also important to note that a shelf life item with a compromised barrier bag is considered to be expired and should not be remediated and placed back into stock. For non-shelf life items, such as the one in our example, the shelf life dates are not applicable and therefore omitted. What you are left with is the most complete mill standard 129 unit pack label information we can produce for this item. As for the barcode, if your organization has the capability to print barcodes, then do so. Remember to include NSN data and, if applicable, the serial number and unique item identifier. While it is expected that the vendors supplying these items will have this capability, Army supply support activities may not. If your SSA cannot produce barcodes, then print the labels without them. This concludes our walkthrough on how to gather MIL standard 129 unit pack identification data. Next, we will demonstrate how to determine if method 50 or ESDS markings are required. Determining if an item requires a method 50 or ESDS label is a simple, straightforward process. To accomplish this, we will once again refer to the FedLog Packaging tab to find the information we need. Begin by observing the mop number. If it is one of the five Method 50 mops, 51, 52, 53, 54, or 55, then Method 50 labels are required on both the barrier bag and the unit container. If the mop is GX, then you will need to apply ESDS labels in the same fashion. If the mop is 41 and the item is electrical in nature, such as a power supply, circuit card, or control panel, some additional detective work must be done to determine if the item is sensitive to electrostatic discharge. First, on the packaging tab, look down the row from the mop to the special markings data field. If this code is 39, then the item is ESDS. If this field is empty, or anything other than 39, click on the Army Master Data File tab and look at the ESD data field. If it is B or D, the item is ESDS. As we have seen, there are ideally up to 10 different pieces of information that can be included on a unit pack identification label. The national stock number, cage code, part number, nomenclature, quantity, contract number, method of preservation, shelf life dates, serial number, and barcode. 
If the item you are remediating has a good MIL standard 129 unit pack identification label, then simply copy over that information onto a new label and apply it to the remediated packaging. If, however, the current label is not available or is missing information, use FedLog in combination with a thorough examination of the item to fill in the missing information to the best of your abilities. When researching your preservation requirements, if the item is a MOP 51, 52, 53, 54, or 55, a Method 50 warning label must be applied. Similarly, if the item has a MOP of GX, the item is electrostatic discharge sensitive, and an ESDS warning label must be applied. If the item is electrical in nature and has a MOP of 41, you must check the special markings and ESD fields in FedLog to determine if the item is ESDS. Lastly, all MIL standard 129 unit pack identification labels and special markings should always be applied to both the barrier bag and the unit container to ensure the item can always be properly identified and handled correctly. This concludes Module 5, Unit Pack Marking Requirements. And always remember, knowing that your stock is ready for issue in batch code A condition isn't an accident. It's Kosis. Do you have a packaging, hazmat, shelf life, or WPM question? PSCC Packaging and Transportation Division wants to help. Give us a call or send us an email and let us know how we can assist you.